And Max Kaiser, this is the Kaiser Report El Salvador. Big day for El Salvador. Let's talk about it. Stacey. Well, Bitcoin becomes legal tender today in El Salvador. It's the beginning of an experiment, you can, might say. But bear in mind that El Salvador until today had one legal tender, which was the U.S. dollar, which is itself a 50-year experiment begun August 15th, 1971. So it's an experimental, innovative nation, and it's going full Bitcoin today. Right. Who would have thought? Well, I think we had a suspicion. It's a, a, almost exactly 10 years ago today when we first introduced to the world the idea of Bitcoin. It was trading at a dollar, and this was back in 2011. And I said it would be the biggest story of the decade. And certainly that has proven to be the case. And now we've got El Salvador making Bitcoin legal tender. I, we should note that this is really in part due to the Herculean effort of Jack Mahler's over there at the Strike app. So this is the beginning of a new era. You know, this is why I'm wearing their color of their flag. Max has his flag hat on, the El Salvador flag there. And just to give you some data, just so you understand what El Salvador is, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, it is um, the economy is in US dollar terms, 26.28 billion which on purchasing power parity, if you adjust for how much that dollar goes there versus in the US, it's actually then you could say it's a $58 billion economy in PPP terms. But importantly, 23% of their GDP is remittances, mostly from the United States. Right. So the remittance market, this is a huge business around the world. And in El Salvador's case, you're saying 23% of the GDP is money that is sent into El Salvador, principally from the United States, but elsewhere in the world from people who are working abroad, and then they're sending money back to their family. Now, with this new Bitcoin as tender law and the application of app apps like Strike, the cost of sending that remittance, the 23% of GDP in rem is the remittance, is going to be reduced by probably 98%. And the estimates last I saw was that this 23 billion or PPP adjusted $28 billion economy is going to increase by $2 billion day one. So in 2020, which was the largest year for remittances, they saw about six billion remit remitted to their economy. Um, so yeah, on that six billion, there's a wide range of how much the likes of Western Union charges, but it's pretty significant. So they're hoping to cut up to a billion dollars just on remittances costs uh, to the economy, which is substantial, obviously, to you know just on a nominal numbers, $26.28 billion economy. Right. Okay. So they'll cut a billion off remittances. I said $2 billion. Uh, certainly over the course of two or three or five years, you're talking about billions of dollars. And that has a huge impact on this particular economy, given the size of the economy. My understanding also is that the, the country will now tap into their volcano energy, the geothermal energy. They're set to generate another billion dollars in revenue from mining Bitcoin because the cost of that volcano energy is virtually zero. Okay, add another billion to the mm. GDP. Uh, add the fact that property values are going to go up. Add the fact that tourism is going to go up. Add the fact that all those entrepreneurs that are plugging into the Bitcoin network in El Salvador are going to add to the GDP. This country's GDP in El Salvador, it looks like in the next year to three years, it's going to be one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And certainly, if you look at it, the timing of this is that the biggest economy in the world on a PPP level is China, okay? China decided to ban Bitcoin mining, thus driving down the difficulty rate, thus increasing the profit for anybody who decides to mine. So it is a good moment for El Salvador in order to mine Bitcoin there using their free, essentially, free energy, the geothermal caused by the volcanic activity in the area. Yeah, if you look at history, different technologies have impacted 
countries and civilizations and empires differently, going back to the Roman Empire and the introduction of the aqueduct, for example, as a technology, uh, modern roads, another technology, uh, the modern cement goes back to uh, those days, and it had a huge impact on the infrastructure and the growth of those empires. Here we have Bitcoin, which is uh, really the most remarkable new development in infrastructure for a country we've seen in hundreds of years. And one country, China, is um, eschewing that technology much to its detriment. And here we have El Salvador uh, in a position who's embracing the technology. So the tectonic plates of Geopolitics are shifting, and we're going to see Latin American countries led by El Salvador start to move up. I think this is the big surprise in the 21st century. People assumed China was going to be the big winner of the 21st century. I think China will be, along with the United States, coterminous. I think they'll both fall apart. And we'll see countries like El Salvador and other nimble, smaller, entrepreneurially led countries really take off. In Africa, Nigeria, is it remarkable what's happening there. That's where really global GDP is improving completely outside of all the NGOs and the globalists, the World Bank and the IMF and the Davos crowd. This is sovereignty by Bitcoin and we're seeing the world change. There are some local protests about this law, but we'll get to that in a moment. I do want to point out, this is a remarkable experiment and a moment equivalent to, I believe, August 15th, 1971, when the world went off the gold standard essentially, and just went on to an all fiat US dollar standard. And remember, it was quite tumultuous. Remember the 70s after that uh, to, you know, basically ensure the world to have faith in the dollar. And it took kind of Paul Volcker jacking rates up really high to make sure that the world believed in the US dollar. So we see that that faith started to disintegrate all over the world, mostly through the weaponization of the dollar rails uh, as a global financial system, because obviously you need uh, neutral rails to make it work. So we'll go to um, some of the protests that were covered in Bitcoin Magazine here. Here's the headline. El Salvador's Bitcoin adoption met with small protests. Small groups of protesters have taken to the streets one week before El Salvador adopts Bitcoin as legal currency. Protests against the Bitcoin law and President Nayib Bukele are becoming more common ahead of it taking effect on September 7th, which is today. This article was from last week. Local San Salvador media sources said the protesters believe Bitcoin will pose a serious threat to El Salvador's economy. Business Insider reported, one argument is that just as the El Salvadoran government can't control the United States debasing their dollars, which they are currently totally dependent on, they won't be able to control a Bitcoin economy either. <laughs> That's right. They, they can't control America debasing their dollar, and they can't control the fact that the purchasing power of Bitcoin, by mathematical certainty, will continue to go up. And that's what you want with your currency. I think that once it rolls up and people use it, I think that within a few weeks, people will fall in love with this. And they'll take pride in the fact that El Salvador has changed the world. And, you know, it was uh, December 7th, 1941, the Day of Infamy, uh, which was recorded in world history as being called the Day of Infamy. And um, that was all about fiat money and war. That was World War II, which was brought, brought to you by the money printers at the central banks. And this is a day that's going to reverse all that. 80 years of the, uh, a century of war br printed out of the, the end of a printing gun. And uh, now we're going to have an, the love bomb, Bitcoin. And uh, El Salvador is uh, the beginning of, of a new century. Yeah, indeed. And by the way, I might point out, again, like this is an experiment and it's a radical and revolutionary one. And I think it's quite brave because... Indeed, the government will have no control over it, but they are certain of it. The, the you know, emissions schedule of Bitcoin is certain and known, and they know it, and they can plan and build around that, and that's important. I think the experiment of the U.S. dollar and the, the central banks that collude, as Nomi um, Prinz says in her book, Collusion, that they're going to try to maintain their otherwise failed experiment with CBDCs, central bank digital currencies. Uh, El Salvador is front running them by introducing Bitcoin, but I think these other bigger economies like the US Fed, like the ECB, like the Bank of Japan will roll out their digital currencies, which 
are, are basically just the same, but in digital format. But because of the digital format, they can impose negative interest rates on ordinary savers and a social credit score whereby they could basically denounce you for per using your money in certain ways. Right. Well, governments have no control over the orbits of planets, sun r the rising in the east, gravity. Hurricanes. <laughs> hurricanes, mathematical certainty, two plus two equals four, right? So that's right. They have no control over absolute scarcity, something that was discovered in 2008, implemented in 2009. And it's something mankind has been searching for his entire existence, hundreds of thousands of years. This has been looked for, has been the try to find absolute scarcity. And the Bukele, leadership in El Salvador, entrepreneur, smart guy, might go down in history as really the smartest leader of the past hundred years. Right. Well, we'll see. We're going to keep on top of this and we're going to obviously keep on observing this and hopefully travel to El Salvador in the next few months. I know there's a big Bitcoin party plan there. I'm not going to tell you when, unless you're invited or where. So um, I also want to point out, you know, in terms of them already being pegged to the U.S. dollar in this sort of time where it seems like lockdowns and stimulus and the mindset, remember we've talked about the inflationary mindset and the mindset of wanting UBI and wanting debt forgiveness and all the money printing, like this is the sort of story here and this final little chart here that they have to worry about going forward. All these smaller nations that do have some sort of link to the U.S. dollar parabolic spike in cost to ship 40-foot container from Shanghai to Los Angeles, now at $11,400 versus $3,500 this time a year ago. As you see, those people concerned in El Salvador about the volatility, that's volatility in your currency there, right there. Yeah, this is, uh, the inflation now is uh, bleeding through in all aspects of the economy, and it's structural, it's secular, it's going to be with us for many years, and it's going to destroy the quality of life for billions of people and in the U.S. and around the world. And uh, El Salvador is actually making a bold step to neutralize the inflationary impact of the destruction of fiat money. I might add that would be very flat, the price of the container, the 40-foot container in Bitcoin from last year at this time. Right. Priced in Bitcoin terms, there's been no increase. No increase in the past. If you look over the five-year time frame, the cost of shipping and everything else has gone down. It, your purchasing power is guaranteed to go up, mathematically guaranteed as the Earth uh, revolves around the sun, as the uh, sun rises in the east, your purchasing power is mathematically guaranteed to increase with Bitcoin. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, much more coming your way. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to return to our conversation with Mish Shedlock of MishTalk.com. Mish, welcome back, and let me jump right in here. You know, we were talking in the first segment about, as you described, the new Troika with uh, basically Jay Powell at the Fed, Janet Yellen at Treasury, and um, I forget the third, but another banker, no doubt. And uh, we're also talking about politics and will this bill pass? It's a multi-trillion, $3.5 trillion sink America plan, as you call it. But before we get into the, the plan, the politics of it, aren't we in a post-political age, Mesh? I mean, it doesn't really matter what the bills, no matter what's in the bill, uh, it's always gonna be just more money printing and keeping interest rates near zero and lying about inflation. So it doesn't really matter what's in the bill, so why should we care? I think it doesn't matter what's in the bill, but yes, you are correct that uh, no matter what is in the bill, even whether it passes or not, uh, the, the Fed, uh, we've got trillion dollar deficits as far as the eye can see, whether we throw another three and a half trillion on top of it or not. But that three and a half trillion really is you know Im important there's there's things in there that are pro union that are going to drive up prices there's there's uh this energy tax which is uh, the absolutely the craziest thing in the bill if you ask me and uh then there's you know whatever's in there that we don't even know about yet the, that they're going to try and hide in there that's one of these things we're going to have to pass it to see it but those things all add up but it's that energy piece that I referred to, that I called the 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 Sink America 
plan because that is not transitory. You know, they want 80% uh, clean energy by uh, 2030 uh, uh, and 100% by 2035. So this is progressive. You know, so every year we're going to need more and more and more and more. Every year costs on corporations are going to go up and up and up and up. And if corporations don't uh, do what uh, uh, Congress wants, what Biden wants, what AOC most particular uh, definitely does not want, if they don't, if the whole world doesn't do what AOC wants, then we are going to raise taxes on them until they comply. That is what they're talking about. We don't know if it's in there or not, because we've not even seen an outline yet. But rest assured, that's what AOC wants in there. And she has also gone on record, along with a handful of other progressives, that say, if this isn't in there, uh, there's like 95 progressives in the House that say, if this isn't in there, we're going to kill the whole thing. Now, what's the best thing that can possibly happen out of all of this? They kill the whole thing. That's what I'm rooting for. But I suspect something will pass. Question is, what is it? I've talked to a lot of millennials and Gen Z, and they're not really buying this political divide anymore. And the way you're describing here is you've got progressives, as you call them, uh, on the left that are talking about trying to tie energy in with some progressive agenda. Uh, and you've got corporations on the other side who would be potentially taxed, et cetera. And what I'm hearing from millennials and the Gen Z, Mish, is that they don't believe a word of it. Uh, they don't believe AOC anymore. They don't believe anybody on the conservative movement anymore. They know it's all a puppet show. They know it's all staged. They know that they're all corrupt. They know that they all get a huge payday from trading on inside information and making celebrity endorsements, right? So I think we've moved on from the idea that there's, a, there's, there's no longer a political debate in America. Look, look at what happened in Afghanistan. America flew out of there leaving, by some estimates, $85 billion worth of our tax money in weapons of mass destruction when, in the blink of an eye, right? So they didn't, they didn't give five seconds of thought because they all got paid. They all got paid. Doesn't matter, right? So it, it gets me back to your point about the Troika. That, that's who's running the show, the money printers. I, until we do something about that, Mish, the, the, the political debate is just window dressing, my friend. At a certain level and on certain things, um, it, uh, on military spending, I mean, look at all the people criticizing Biden for actually ending a 20-year war. Okay, he made a mess of the exit. You know, it's 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 hard to whitewash. The, you know, him making a mess of the exit. But what was the alternative? The alternative was to stay in for another twenty. Years. There are a lot of people that wanted to do that. Mainly the military-industrial complex. You know, which is where this has all started. You know, we we've wasted uh, easily six trillion dollars over there. We would we, we certainly would have been better off spending that money here, right? The, the uh, so it's no wonder they're skeptical, but and it's no wonder there's mistrust. The mis both of those are well deserved, but that doesn't mean you can't make things worse. You know, you, you can always make things worse, and one of the reasons, one of the ways to make things worse is is to do this package that I'm talking about. You know, the, the uh, I don't believe we have instant flat stagflation uh, unless they pass this energy component that I'm talking about. They probably don't see it that way because they don't understand. Hardly anybody understands, and the people who do are lying about it. So it's no wonder we're in this mess. Does Biden really believe, as he, as he says, that this package won't be inflationary? Well, maybe he's dumb enough to believe that. 
But that doesn't mean everyone should believe that. You and I certainly don't look at this package and believe it. But yes, it, it matters. I mean, it, it, to say nothing matters implies that, you know, we, we can all of a sudden give a million dollars every day, you know, to everybody, you know, and that's probably the goal, unfortunately. That's the goal of uh, not a million dollars per se, but of, of the Andrew Yangs, of the AOCs, uh, uh, of the you know of the of the progressive movement is a guaranteed living wage to all. I just can't say that if we do that, it doesn't matter because it does. Unfortunately, that is the direction this Biden Express is on. Talking about uh, the daily dispensation of cash, the uh, twenty-year Fandango in Afghanistan was awarding $300 million a day to Chuck Prince, you know, Blackwater, bunch of contractors, not Chuck Prince, Eric Prince. I was thinking about the old Citibank chair. Same thing, <laughs> yes. same difference, right? <laughs> so here you have, uh, but, and now, so I hear what you're saying, Mish. I mean, you're, you're, you're offering a message of hope that the political process can still work and that we need a good, healthy debate. And I think that's uh, I think that's a good point of view to have. You know? Actually, my message of hope is the political process collapses. The Democrats only have two Republican senators to spare. Uh, excuse me, no senators to spare. They need two, the votes of two senators. They only have three House votes to spare. Uh, you know, I, I'm hoping that the political process here collapses and they can't get these people on board. I, you know, that, that's the best hope to sanity here. We just have to wait and see what, what it is exactly they're going to do uh, at the end of this month. That's the target for the outline. Now, we finally have a date for the outline. We don't have an outline. We got a date for the outline. <laughs> right. Well, uh, I want your opinion about this. So uh, given the political spectrum that we're describing and the struggle for power, as uh, one often finds in the political arena, uh, AOC, who you mentioned, and her cohort are seeking membership on the Federal Reserve Board. They would like to join in with the Federal Reserve and Jay Powell, and they would like to make sure that the money that's being printed goes into their uh, pet causes like uh, climate change, et cetera. So they're they're not waiting for the political process to resolve itself, Mish. They're they're the barbarians are at the gate of the Fed. They're like, move over, Jay Powell. We want to print the money, and we want to print the money for our causes because we ourselves realize that the political process is dead. It's all about who prints the money, and AOC wants to be the money printer now, Mish. Uh, is she going to be now successful? This is one one aspect in which, in which you're 100 bang on you know, hear ab about it not mattering. Because the Fed, no matter who's in charge, whether it's Powell or AOC gets her way and they replace her with, uh, uh, who, who is it? Uh, Minneapolis Fed chairman is a brander. The, the, whoever they want is, uh, the, uh, the Fed is ultimately going to do, is ultimately going to carry out the wishes of the, of the administration, whatever that administration is. The uh, so whether Powell's in there or AOC gets her replacement, I mean, you know, there's 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 no mandate here, you know, on the Fed except for two things, right? Full employment and low inflation, and uh, <laughs> they're certainly never going to achieve low inflation when they're hell bent on producing more of it, right? And that's going to happen no matter who is in there. So, you know, in a sense, whether Powell is replaced or not, absolutely does not matter. It's, it's, it's what gets passed. The, the Fed is going to support no matter, almost no matter what it is. And let's look at the markets for a second, because ultimately we like to look at prices and see how things are playing out in the markets. And of course, one a market we've talked about for many years is the gold market. Over the past 10 year chart, it's been it's down 3% over the past 10 years. It's not doesn't seem to be reflecting a lot of these trends, or maybe it is. We've got about 40 seconds left. What do you think? Gold's kind of interesting. Um, it it it's a measure of faith in central banks. 
that faith goes, you know, up and down, you know, uh, not too long ago was a thousand and rose all the way six years ago, I believe was approaching a thousand, you know, now it approached 2000 twice. It's fallen back a little bit. Everyone seems to think that believes the fed that it's transitory and that the fed is actually going to do some tapering and is not going to monetize the whole world. We all know max that's wrong. Gold is one of the few things that's not in a bubble. I'm convinced that gold someday is going to be a bubble. I'm holding on to my gold waiting for that moment, Max, because I think it's coming. All right. Thanks for being on Kaiser Report, Mish. Always a pleasure to be on, Max. Uh, thanks for having me back. All right. And that's going to do it for this edition of Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I want to thank our guest, Mish Shedlock of MishTalk.com. Until next time, bye, y'all.